All right, so welcome back. This is uh, Physics 251, the next video in Chapter 8. Uh, we're going to start with Section 8.3, as you can see. So I uh, hope you can see this um, PowerPoint. I'm going to be down here. <laughs> uh, okay, so we have just defined, if we go back, uh, we've defined potential energy. Uh, now we're going to talk about the conservation of energy. Um, the statement here says that if there are no non-conservative forces, the sum of the changes in kinetic and total potential energy is zero. So a little bit of clarification there. There are different kinds of uh, potential energy. We talked about uh, gravitational potential energy, spring potential energy. This statement is, says the sum of the changes in kinetic and all potential is zero. Okay, if there are no non-conservative forces, if there's no resistive forces like friction or push-pulling forces like with you know people. Um, so this allows us, this concept allows us to define total mechanical energy, which is um, the energy, total mechanical energy, I call it E total. Okay, um, definitely gonna, here, let's zoom in, um, or write it a little bit bigger. So. Good. <laughs> All right. E total uh, equals kinetic plus uh, U gravitational plus U spring. Okay. Um, so <clears throat> that's just a little bit uh, more detailed than what you see there. Conservation means total energy, energy total one equals energy total two or uh, energy total initial could be initial equals energy total final. All right. Um, again, I'll zoom in when we um, when we look at some problems. Uh, definitely, you won't have to peer down here in the corner and see what's going on there. Um, so this is the statement again made in words that the if only conservative forces are doing work, total mechanical energy of the system neither increases nor decreases in any process. Okay, so again, mechanical energy is that kind of um, energy that can do work, right? Work changes the energy of the system. Um, there are other forms of energy, <coughs> chemical potential energy, thermal energy, but mechanical energy, specifically kinetic, plus um, this gravitational potential energy and spring potential energy. Okay, so this, <coughs> this slide, uh, it kind of gives us a very basic example. You drop a rock, okay? Um, at the top, when you're lifting, when you're holding the rock, it has potential energy. You did work to lift it up there, um, but no kinetic energy. It's not moving yet. So you, you let it go, uh, begins to acquire kinetic energy and lose its potential energy. Um, at any point, that, that uh, formula E equals K plus U is true at any point along the way, okay? So uh, you can use that to calculate the speed because, of course, at the initial position, the total energy is just mgh, no kinetic. At the bottom, the total energy is kinetic, no potential. So <coughs> um, you could calculate the kinetic energy at, and therefore the speed at any point along the way. Um, so let's do that. Let's do a very simple example um, very quickly. Original height of the rock is three meters. Okay, so we have um, energy total one equals mgh. Okay, which is uh, we don't know what m is, but g is nine point eight meters per second squared times h of uh, three meters. Okay. Uh, calculate the rock speed when it's fallen to one meter above the ground. So energy total two is one half m v squared. You're gonna you see how the m's are gonna cancel plus uh, m times nine point eight meters per second squared times one. Okay. Uh, in fact, I'm gonna just go ahead and zoom this back up for now so we can see what we're doing. There you go. All right, so 
Uh, energy total 2, 1 half mv squared plus m times 9.8 times 1. Um, so we set these equal to each other. Uh, ET1 equals ET2, so we can cancel all of the m's. We get 9.8 times 3.0 on the left equals 1 half v squared plus 9.8 times 1, right, taking out the units. Uh, this would just be 9.8 times 2, <clears throat> but then you multiply it by 4, so we have 4 times 9.8 square root, and that gives us our speed, okay? So, uh, doing our little calculator thing, uh, 4 times 9.8, roughly the squared, square root of 40, right? Uh, I get 6.26. 6.26 meters per second. Okay? All right, so that's a pretty uh, fast way, pretty straightforward, fast way of um, calculating the speed uh, given the initial height. Okay? All right, so we could do this again, assuming that the height of the hill is 40 meters, the roller coaster starts from rest, calculate the speed of the roller coaster at the bottom of the hill. We just saw how we don't really need the mass because the mass cancels, okay? Um, <clears throat> so you can do that if you want. But a uh, conceptual example, um, two water slides at a pool shaped differently, but start at the same, the two riders start at the same height H, okay? Um, so they start at the same time, which rider Paul or Kathleen is traveling faster at the bottom, okay? All right, so we, we just saw that mass doesn't matter, okay? That, uh, so they can have different masses. Um, the speed depends on just the height. The speed that they have at the bottom depends on just the height. Uh, and if they start at the same height, then that means they will uh, be traveling at the same speed at the bottom. Now, uh, here we see a huge, huge advantage of uh, doing this problem with conservation of energy. Because in order to do this problem with work, right, forces, we would have to know the shape of the slide, right? We'd have to calculate the, you know, the path, the, you know, the continuous path, uh, do the dot product between the force over that path traveled. Uh, that's how we would calculate this with, uh, with work and forces. Um, but we can't if we don't know the shape of the slide. We just know that there's, Kathleen has this little dip in her slide. Um, so this problem would be, is impossible to solve the conventional way with work and forces. But because of the path independence of potential energy, we don't need to know the path. So this is a very powerful thing a uh, very powerful advantage uh, in some situations of the conservation of energy approach. Um, it allows us to solve a problem that we don't even know details of the path, okay? Um, <clears throat> part B, which rider makes it to the bottom first? Okay, so here's the trade-off, okay? We see the power of conservation of energy, now here's the cost. Um, we, the conservation of energy equation doesn't even involve time. There's no time variable in the conservation of energy equation. It's just potential energy, kinetic energy. Um, so this is an impossible question to solve. Well, I don't, you know, just using conservation of energy alone. We're going to use it. We can obviously solve it with just you know concepts, but different concepts, kinematic concepts. Um, so because Conservation, conservation of energy doesn't involve time, um, that's the trade-off. We don't know when things happen, we just know that they are, they are traveling at the same speed when they hit the bottom, uh, independent of, of path taken. Um, so kinematic-wise, we know that Kathleen gets to the bottom first. Why? Because you know, she loses uh, potential energy first, like her slide has a dip, she loses potential energy first, um, and therefore gains kinetic energy first, and therefore at every point along the slide, she's traveling faster except at the last point, right? Paul, uh, at every point that you, that you look at on this slide, Paul has not lost uh, as much kinetic, or has lost as much potential energy 
and has not gained as much kinetic energy at every point along the slide. So that means Kathleen is traveling faster at every point along the slide, except for the very last. Okay, um, so that kind of highlights the, uh, the comparison between work and energy conservation problems and then just kinematics, forces, dynamics, that kind of thing. So sometimes uh, problems will lend themselves to being solved with dynamics, sometimes they'll lend themselves to being solved with conservation of energy. Uh, this is obviously a good example of one that <coughs> will lend itself to being solved with conservation of energy. So you've got this pole vaulter, right? Uh, estimate the kinetic energy and speed required for a 70 kilogram pole vaulter to just pass over a bar five meters high. Assume the vaulter's center of mass is initially 0.9 meters off the ground and reaches the maximum height at the level of the bar itself. So uh, obviously this is impossible with, with dynamics. We don't even know the forces. We don't know the spring constant of the pole. We don't know, um, you know, the <clears throat> the forces exerted on the pole, so we can't use dynamics. It's just impossible. But here we can use uh, energy and say, okay, energy one, the total energy one, is the speed that he was traveling at, one half mv squared plus mv1 squared plus mgh1. Okay, uh, energy total two is one half mv2 squared plus mgh2. Okay, um, <clears throat> all right, so I'm gonna slide this over give myself some extra room. Okay, so we have uh, kinetic energy speed and kinetic energy. Um, that's what they're asking us for. 70 kilograms. Okay, times V1 squared. Still to do this, good. Uh, plus 70 kilograms times G, 9.8 meters per second squared. Oh. Okay, just need to slide over a little bit more. Um, <clears throat> times 0.9 meters. Okay, uh, for the second one, energy is zero, kinetic energy rather, speed is zero, plus 70 kilograms times 9.8 meters per second squared times uh, the five meter height. <coughs> so, we set energy total one equal to energy total two. That's our conservation of energy principle, right? That's the basic idea that we're working with here. Leads us to calculate uh, V1 is equal to, all right, you can do the math yourself, but we've got uh, 70 times 9.8 times five minus 0.9 is 4.1. Uh, and then, multiply by 2, divide by 70, take the square root of that, uh, 8.96 is what I get, meters per second. Okay, so uh, let's pull this up and make sure that worked. Can you see that okay? All right, so again, we're writing down the energy. You can freeze frame if you need to, but we're writing down the total energy up here, right? Uh, kinetic plus potential, plug the terms in. Uh, kinetic energy here uh, is zero plus potential. Uh, the setting the energy is equal to each other yields uh, the speed. All right. So, um, nine meters per second, yeah. Okay, uh, this is another good one. Um, spring, <coughs> spring loaded gun. So, uh, I'm not gonna work through this. You can work through this yourself, but um, there we go. Uh, this, instead of gravitational potential energy involves spring potential energy, we just see that 
the total energy is kinetic plus spring potential at the initial point, and then the final total energy is kinetic plus spring at the final point. Um, so you can use that to solve for uh, the final speed, okay? All right, this one is a little bit more interesting. I'm, we got a couple more before, uh, yeah, I'm gonna, I'm actually gonna stop with uh, section eight, seven. But, okay, so <clears throat> if we look at this one, let's, let's look at this. Uh, ball of mass, 2.6 kilograms, starting from rest falls a vertical distance of 55 centimeters uh, before striking a vertical coiled spring, which it compresses in amount 15 centimeters. Determine the spring stiffness constant of the spring. Assume the spring has negligible mass. Why do we do that? Because this, as the spring falls down, uh, if it had mass, it would be losing potential energy and, and that would contribute to the system. Um, so we're just going to neglect the, the mass of the spring so that we don't um, need to account for the energy of the spring, the potential energy of the spring. Um, measure all distances from the point where the ball first touches the uncompressed spring. Now, again, we don't have to do that. That's optional, but, you know, okay, let's just do that. Uh, do what they said. So um, <clears throat> the mass, uh, my looks like my screen is about right from there to right there. Okay, so um, we've got a mass of 2.6 kilograms. We've got um, initial height H of 55 centimeters. Okay, and then we've got a compression distance Y of 15 centimeters. Okay. See that right? All right, so let's uh, zoom this back up so you can see what I'm doing here. Okay, so we've got energy total one equals energy total two. That's what we always write down, right? Draw a box around it, remind yourself that's our starting point. That's, uh, that's the concept of energy conservation. So energy total one is going to be uh, kinetic, one half mv1 squared plus m1gh, oh, sorry, mgh1, that's potential energy, uh, plus spring potential energy, one half k x1 squared, right? So that's energy total one. Energy total two, one half mv2 squared plus mgh2 plus one half k x2 squared. So this is the first problem where we are uh, folding in both kinds of potential energy, right? Now, um, it start, it's, it's dropped from rest, and then it comes to a stop at maximum compression, so both of these guys go away, right? If we're, drive, if we're measuring the initial height from the uncompressed point of the spring, we've got uh, 2.6 kilograms, Right, times G 9.8. Uh oh. I think we're, I'm gonna have to s slide this over. <coughs> times um, initial height 0.55 meters. Okay, there we go. <laughs> uh, plus the spring potential energy, one half. Um, let's go back. What is that? Oh, the decay is what we're trying to find. Right, all right. Uh, one half K times, um, it was not compressed in the initial position when we're letting it go. The spring isn't compressed yet, so that's actually zero. So, uh, that's it. When we've got, uh, when it's in the maximum compressed position, we've got mass, 2.6 kilograms, times 9.8 meters per second squared times <coughs> the final height uh, measured from the uncompressed position is negative 0.15 meters, okay? Uh, plus this one half K times the compression distance of um, negative 0.15 meters, compression displacement of negative 1.5 meters squared. Again, 
compression or extension, that's also uh, measured from equilibrium position. So it definitely could have a negative, but of course it gets squared, so negative goes away anyway. All right, so setting E1 equals to E2, you see that up there, right? Gives us K is equal to, let's go ahead and do the math here, see what we get. <coughs> we see that it's really come down to 2.6 times 9.8 times a point, a total distance fallen of 0.7, okay, uh, times 2, and then divided by 0.15 squared. So I get 1,585 as my, right, newtons per meter, it's my spring constant. Okay, so, Going down again. All right, so let's return. So I want you to do this. <coughs> um, this example you can do by yourself. It's actually a homework problem as well, so give that a shot. But uh, same idea. Okay, you calculate the total potential energy and kinetic energy at any point along the the swing. Here, right. Um, the height y equals zero is the bottom of the swing. That's actually a convenient point to, to pick for your y equals zero point. Um, but of course, the height can be written as, if you see on this diagram, uh, L minus L cosine theta. Uh, they write that in terms of the initial angle at which the pendulum is released, theta naught, but you can write that as any theta, okay? so. Gravitational potential energy depends on whatever angle theta this pendulum is at, which allows you to calculate uh, all these other things. They ask you for, uh, as a function of position, the speed of the bob, right? And then find the tension as a function of position. So give that a shot. Let me know what you, let me know what you think. If there's, you know, if you have any questions, just let me know. All right. Uh, so, non-conservative forces, when we bring them into the picture, we see that, okay, um, our energy, our mechanical energy is not conserved, we're going to lose it. So, instead of saying the total changes in kinetic and potential must be equal to zero, we account for the change in all the other forms of energy um, by adding an extra term into our, our conservation of energy equation. So that change in other forms of energy, uh, uh, here, for us, <coughs> for us, this is going to be thermal. Okay, so um, we have up here change in kinetic plus change in potential, which has a gravitational spring in it, plus change in thermal energy equals zero, and the change in thermal energy is equal to the negative of work done by friction. The work done by friction, if it's present, is the negative of force of friction times the distance. Okay? <clears throat> Let's pull this up so you can see that. All right, so um, this is our revised conservation of energy equation in terms, in the presence of resistive forces. Forms of resistance uh, generate friction, which uh, generates heat. That's what we call it, thermal energy, uh, when friction does work. Um, <coughs> when friction does work, uh, it's always negative. Friction never adds energy to the system. It always takes it out, okay? That's why this is always negative. The other reason is, of course, that the force of friction is in the opposite direction of the displacement, so our dot product has a negative sign. Either way, we define the change in thermal energy to be the negative of the work done. Okay, <clears throat> so um, when these when these changes, when we lose kinetic or we lose potential, we're going to gain thermal energy. So when friction is is acting, uh, these changes are going to be negative. Uh, this change is going to be positive, and you can kind of see that it's going to be positive because it's the negative of the work done by friction, okay? 
work done by friction is itself negative, these negatives cancel, and so I just get force of friction times uh, the displacement, okay? All right, so, zooming back down. All right, so if we account for all forms of energy, then we can make the biggest possible version of the conservation of energy concept or principle that says total energy of any kind is neither increased nor decreased in any process. Energy can be transformed from one form to another and transferred from one object to another, but the total, including all forms, remains constant. And of course, the modern version of that is the total matter energy, total mass energy of any system, because of course mat equals mc squared tells us that mass can be converted to energy. So um, that is a cornerstone of physics in the modern version that involves mass energy conservation. Uh, for our version uh, behind me, right, this is our version that we're going to be using for chapter 8. <clears throat> okay. Um, this I guess this, uh, you know, we can talk through this one. Friction on the roller coaster car. So if it reaches a vertical height, so it starts off at a height of 40 meters, as you can see in the picture. Let me get, let me, get me out of the way. There you go. Uh, starts off at 40 meters, ends up at 25 meters. Uh, it's at rest in either position. So you would calculate the change in potential energy between points. All right, this is your final position, initial position. Uh, position two is final, initial is one. I forget, you can't see my cursor. <coughs> but the difference there is negative. Okay, that negative is the uh, positive change in thermal energy. Uh, so that's pretty straightforward. All right. Um, here, same kind of thing block of mass sliding across a rough horizontal surface, traveling at a speed v naught when it strikes a massless spring head on, compresses the spring a dis maximum distance x. If the spring has stiffness constant k, determine the friction between of the coefficient of kinetic friction between the block and the surface. So we're going to do this one. All right. Um, <clears throat> so uh, initial speed v naught. Okay, make myself sort of medium sized there. Uh, <coughs> chain kinetic energy. Well, final is zero. Initial is one half m v naught squared, okay, uh, final spring potential energy is one half k compression distance x squared, uh, initial spring energy was zero, so minus zero, plus delta e thermal energy, okay, well thermal energy we just sh showed how that's just the force of friction times the distance traveled, but the distance traveled is actually uh, capital X as well, because we're starting, we're starting from when the block impacts the spring, and we end with uh, the block being at rest. So, equals zero. Okay. All right. <clears throat> now, so we can write um, force of friction. This tells us the force of friction is equal to uh, one half k x compression distance squared minus one half m v naught squared divided by my distance x. And the force of friction itself is, uh, for this level surface, um, mu k m g. So we have uh, an m and a g down here, right, once we get that in. <coughs> so um, I guess, right, determine the kinetic co the coefficient of kinetic friction is this formula, right? Because we weren't actually given any values. So um, I'll make this bigger and you can freeze frame if you need to write it down, but uh, there you go. So starting point, revise kinetic energy plus potential change in kinetic energy plus change in potential energy plus change in thermal equals zero. That's our revised uh, upgraded law of conservation of energy in the presence of uh, dissipative forces like friction. Calculate the change in each kind, okay? Um, <coughs> then you can just, uh, given the force of friction is a mu k mg, mg being the normal force, uh, this is my compression distance x, which is the same as that right there. 
uh, you can sell from UK. All right, so uh, I'm going to go ahead and stop there, stop the video there. Uh, again, as always, let me know if you have any questions. Um, come on, flashback recorder. Here we go. Uh, all right, so I'm going to stop the video there. Um, as always, let me know if you have any questions. Homework-wise, uh, you got to be cracking on these homeworks, folks. They're going to start piling up. I've got I've got this system going now, so um, I'm going to be cranking out the videos. Like I said, I stand by my no deadlines uh, policy. You do what you can when you can, but it's got to be done at the end of the semester. So um, again, let me know if you have any questions. Hope you're doing well. I'll talk to you later.